Good morning and welcome along to our Church at Home worship service. Thank you for joining with us and making time to share together in the worship and Word of God. My name is Robin Brown. I'm the teaching elder in First Presbyterian Church, Portadown. And you'll probably already realise that with the extension of the lockdown restrictions, in-person activities within our church buildings will not be resuming for quite some time yet. Please do watch on Facebook or on our website to see uh, details of when such meetings will resume. Our services continue online this evening at 6.30pm. You can catch that on Facebook or on YouTube. We have a family Zoom quiz and get together for families who have children of primary school age. And again, the details of how to log on to that Zoom meeting are available on the bulletin, on the website or on Facebook. Wednesday night, the midweek Bible study in Job will continue, available online at 7.30pm. And we'll meet for prayer at 8 on Zoom and also again on Friday night at 8 on Zoom. And it's good to see the numbers uh, begin to pick up on these prayer meetings. Do please set aside time and come and join with us for those hours of prayer. Finally, for now, there will be an opportunity to leave financial contributions in person at the Watson Street entrance on Saturday next, Saturday the 27th of February from 10 a.m. through to 12 noon. Let's now turn our hearts to worship God. And there in God's word in Matthew 23 and verse 12, we read these words of Jesus who said, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. As we prepare our hearts for worship, let's pause together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can come together before you, not because we deserve it, not because we have lived well or done good, but because you have lived perfectly. You have lived the life we ought to have lived and you have died a death in our place and risen again to new and eternal life so that all those who trust in you will live with you forever. Thank you that in this meantime, we can worship you. We can come and lift our voices in song. We can unite our hearts in prayer and we can contemplate your word as you would speak to us. So bless this time of worship. May it impact our lives so that we might impact your world to your glory. Father, do forgive us. We know how easily we are distracted, how the things of life and the busyness of the world can draw our thoughts away from you. But in these moments, Lord, may we delight to be in your presence. May we desire to know more of you. May we give off ourselves to your service and glory. Lord, bless us as your people as we meet together, even at a distance, in the worship and service of our great King and God, Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. We're going to praise God together as we sing the words of the hymn, Crown Him, with many crimes.
our scripture passage for study this morning is found in the book of Esther, Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. And that will be read for us by Sarah. After which we'll have our children's talk on location. And apologies that it's a bit disjointed because my camera kept blowing over. And then we'll sing together, Better is One Day with Jesus. This morning's Bible reading is found in Esther chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who had guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honour or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. The king said, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honour? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honour more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honour, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honour, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honour. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honour. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Jeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Jeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's a very wet and windy morning this morning. But I'm at Portland Rugby Club because I want to tell you a story from my childhood. Where I grew up in Bangor, my family home, has a, an excellent view of that centre of sporting excellence. Candy Boy Park, or as it's now called, the Bangor Fuel Stadium, the home of Bangor Football Club. Indeed, for a time, my bedroom, when I was in the back bedroom, overlooked the whole of the ground. You had a perfect view of the pitch. It was like having an executive suite all of your own. But because I lived so close to the football ground, I would always be there with my friends. If there was something to go and watch, we would go and watch a game. So on one particular night we heard there was a match on, we didn't know who he was playing, but three of us walked in to see the match and doubled the crowd because Bangor Reserves were playing Glen Torren second. Now it proved to be a, an interesting game for us because one of our neighbours, Paul, was playing centre half for Glen Torren and his job was to mark Jerry Armstrong. You'll have to ask your granddad who Jerry Armstrong is. But Jerry Armstrong was coming back from injury, so he was playing for the reserve to get his match fitness back. And we were watching Jerry Armstrong play against our friend Paul. Now, in those days, football was very basic. And there was only 11 players on the pitch and one substitute. And the substitute had a job until he was required on the pitch, and that was to be linesman. And eventually, Banger used their substitute, and he went on to play 
and the, the manager looked around and, and said to me would you come down and do linesman so I climbed over the fence picked up the flag and began to run the line during the game I made one decision problem was I pointed my flag in the wrong direction and got jeered by my friends and ignored by the referee but that was quite exciting I remember it even now almost 50 years later getting so close I got to the touchline almost onto the pitch but you know that was not what I wanted I didn't want to do lines but I wanted to play that's always been a recurring dream of mine to play in the game to imagine myself going to a, a football match where else but Ellen Road going to watch the great Leeds United play and I would go along to the game and I would take my place in the stand but suddenly the manager Mr Bielsen would realise that he was a player short someone maybe got injured in, in a warm up and, and he would look into the crowd and he would point at me and say we need you come and get changed and I would go and I would play play a blinder score the winning goal and be the hero that's a dream that I've been having now for about 50 years but that would be some miracle wouldn't it some miracle if I could get beyond the touchline get onto the pitch and play in the game but you know God does even greater miracles than this in the Bible we read a story about a, a man called Joseph a man who was sold as a slave by his brothers sold into Egypt and as if that wasn't bad enough while he was in Egypt for no fault of his own Joseph ended up in prison in a foreign country and in a prison how bad could things get for Joseph and yet in a moment Joseph's life changed completely Pharaoh the king of the country said we need you Joseph get changed and Joseph was taken from his prison cell and brought into the court of the king and put in charge of the whole country in a moment Joseph went from serving prisoners in a dungeon to serving and standing before the king in a palace and that's what God invites you and I to do he says I need you I need you get changed have this new life that I want to give you this new heart so that you can serve me in this world that you can come and join me don't stay on the sidelines don't sit in the stand come and be part of the game to see my kingdom advance to my will being done in this world to let people know the love that I have for them that I love them so much that I sent my son to save them come and serve me in this world to make much of Jesus so that he will be glorified and people will be blessed
Let's once again pause and pray as we prepare our hearts to study God's word. Let us pray. Father, we come seeking your help. By your spirit, you need to speak to us. You need to give life to your word, that it would give a life to us, that we would live effectively to your glory. Lord, may we be those who are responsive and obedient and above all, humble in your presence to bring honour and glory to your name. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Some of you, like me, may have grown up watching the Basil Brush Show, which each week concluded with the telling of a dramatic adventure story. And in that moment when the hero was in the most difficult predicament imaginable, the reader of the story, whether Mr Rodney or Mr Derek, would, would suddenly slam the book closed and announce, that's all we have time for this week, Basil. Much to Basil's frustration. And that's where Trevor left us last Sunday morning with the heroes of our story, Esther and Mordecai, in a terrible plight. The clock was ticking. A date had been set for all the Jews to be slaughtered by their neighbours in now less than 11 months, according to the edict promoted by the wicked Haman that had been dispatched all across the vast empire. This act of annihilation would take place. Maybe it's helpful to picture it like this. You, you, you've seen the, the, the scenario where someone's attempting to defuse a bomb and the clock says 20 minutes to detonation and the, the, the person is struggling to figure out what to do and thinks, oh, there's a battery. I'll pull out the battery and see what happens. So he pulls out the battery and suddenly the clock switches to saying only 20 seconds to detonation. In a sense, that's what's, what's happening here. For the Jewish people, there were some months before their execution would come. But for Mordecai, he only has a few hours and counting until he faces death. Haman had commissioned the erecting of a 75 foot high, the ESV says gallows, but it was much more likely to have been just a great big wooden stake, a, a tree trunk with a sharpened point. For the Persians were the first to pioneer the, the, the art of crucifixion as a form of execution. And in its earliest days, it, it consisted simply of a, a stake onto which someone was impaled and they were left there until they died. And that was likely to be Haman's plan for Mordecai. And that's where we left it last Sunday. That was all we had time for. And we were left with a sense of deep frustration. For Esther had found favour in the sight of the king and he had deigned to grant to her anything she requested up to half of the kingdom. And with Esther and her people about to die and she and all the Jews in Susa praying and fasting, surely this was God opening the door for her. All she had to do was ask. But Rather than ask that her people be spared, she invites the king and Haman to join her in a feast that she had prepared. And you might think to yourself, well, maybe that's a good idea. I can see what you're doing here, Esther. Butter him up with some nice food and choice wine, for we all know that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach and all that. And so, for the second time, the king at the feast makes this ridiculously generous offer. Esther chapter 5 and verse 6. We read, And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. And you think to yourself, Another chance. This is it. This is the moment. Grab it with two hands, Esther. Make the big ask. And disappointingly, such an anticlimax for all those who are watching on. Esther simply says, come back tomorrow for another feast and then I'll let you know what I want. How many chances does Esther need? We can't make sense of what's happening here. We don't know why she delayed for another day. 
But of course, if you know the story, you will understand that God is in control and that he has determined the perfect timing for all that will unfold. And, and suddenly, as we start into chapter six, all that has gone before now makes sense. So we turn to our text for this morning and there we read in chapter six, verse one. On that night, the king could not sleep and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. It just so happened that the king couldn't get a good night's sleep on that particular evening. Was it something that he had eaten? Something that Esther had served up to him? We don't know. But what do you do when you cannot get a good night's sleep and you find yourself tossing and turning on your bed at night? In my days as assistant in Rathcool, some of the folk there used to suggest that I could have a great tape ministry for insomniacs. But surely, even more sleep-inducing than one of my sermons would have been to hear the minutes of a meeting read to you. Now, the Bible makes it clear that God is sovereign. He rules over the sleep of kings. Whether it's in Pharaoh's dreams of cows and corn, which led to the rapid promotion of Joseph from prison cell to second in command in the land of Egypt in a single day. Or Nebuchadnezzar's dreams of a golden statue, which led to Daniel's rapid promotion from captive slave to royal advisor. God is in control. He has stolen the sleep from the king. And so... Poor Ahasuerus listens to his servants drone on. This was proposed by Harbona, seconded by Carcass, and agreed. Resolution number four. Reward for Mordecai the Jew for his reporting of the plot to kill the king. And Ahasuerus suddenly, rather than being lulled to sleep by what is being read, is, is stirred into action. He is now reminded that five years previously, Mordecai had been instrumental in foiling an assassination plot on his life. And yet nothing had been done to reward this man for his loyalty. And it's helpful for us to know that in the ancient world, those who helped to protect the king's life were always richly rewarded. This was a practice kings were very eager to promote. It was good for the longevity of their reign. If people knew that there would be very rich rewards to be gained by anyone who unearthed the plot against the throne. And as we noted a couple of weeks ago, somehow the usually efficient civil service of Persia had overlooked this act of loyalty. God working even through an administrative error. Now, it seems that Ahasuerus is not very good at making decisions. And when, everything, when anything has to be decided, he always looks for advice. Even then, in the early hours of the morning, when he has in mind a plan to reward Mordecai, he goes looking to see who might be available within his courts to give him advice on this matter. And it just so happened that the only person available was Haman who had entered the royal courts very early and urgently because he had a pressing request to make of the king. And what a privileged position we have. We have front row seats to see these two men converge, both having Mordecai on their minds. Haman wants to kill him. Ahasuerus wants to honour him. And in Haman's mind, well, this is his request is certain to be granted He's convinced of this because the king's already signed off on the slaughter of an entire people group. What by comparison would be the taking of one life? But before Haman can, can present his request, the king has his own pressing question. Verse 6. So Haman came in and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honour? Oh yes, 
Haman's request that Mordecai be killed is urgent, but that's now superseded by the importance of giving the king a good answer to the king's question because, as Haman says to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And we get a sense here in the writing that Haman doesn't need to take time to think or to come up with a response to the king's question. It's as if he'd been mulling this thought for quite some time. It just flows from his lips. Verses 7 to 9. Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honour, let royal robes be brought which the king has worn and the horse which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and let the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honour, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honour. And let me pause and thinking through the story and just take a moment to learn a lesson from the example of this wicked man. For we need to note that Haman is crippled with pride. I'm sure all of you know the words of Proverbs 16 verse 18 that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We know that Haman is trusting in his position, his possessions and his popularity. And of course, as Trevor helped us see last week, even with this, he's not completely satisfied. And we can guess reading between the lines from Haman's suggestions here that he has long held the desire to be king. Wearing the king's robes, riding on the king's horse. Surely he has his heart set on the king's throne. It's as if this is merely a a dress rehearsal for that great day. And we need to see that, that, that pride is the original sin and the author of all sins. Satan was cast out from heaven. Why? Because he wanted to take the throne of heaven for himself. He wanted to be God. Adam was cast from the Garden of Eden. Why? Because he yielded to the serpent's temptation in Genesis 3 verse 5. That through eating the fruit, you will be like God. Both Satan and Adam, because of their pride, were cast out from the presence of God, cast from their place of power, cast out of paradise. And such a fate is about to befall Naaman as it must. Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 16, verse 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Punishment is certain for those whose hearts are crippled with pride and for those who set themselves up against God. We read in James 4, verse 6, God opposes the pride. Back to the story. Can you imagine the look that appeared on Haman's face when the king said to him, as we read in verse 10, hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Haman is crippled by pride. But by contrast, Mordecai remains confident in God. In the old TV quiz show, The Weakest Link, the announcer, Johnny Briggs, would often say something like this. He would say, well, in a dramatic reversal of fortune, Tom is now the weakest link. Brian is the strongest link. And here in a dramatic reversal of fortune, Mordecai, who the last time we heard of him was sitting clothed in sackcloth and covered in ash and dust, now finds himself wearing the king's robes, being led through the city astride the king's horse by his arch enemy, Haman. Proverbs, again, Proverbs 29, 23 states, One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. 
It seems that Mordecai is not overly impressed by his experience. He just goes back to work, back to the king's gate to resume his duties. But Haman, Haman is devastated. Verses 12 and 13. Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Haman's wife and friends, who had prompted Mordecai to have Mordecai killed, now a bit like a pack of wolves sense a wounded animal among them. And they turn on him and they declare him to be doomed. They understood the writing was on the wall for Haman. And even before Esther can put her plan into action, it's obvious even to these cold-hearted pagans that God is on the move. God is at work, at work for Haman's destruction. And at that very moment, the knock comes to the door. Haman is summoned to go to attend Esther's feast. And that's all we've got time for this week, Basil. So what lessons can we learn from this chapter? Well, we need to see that the hiddenness of God in this story Reminds us that often in life's circumstance, God's hand remains unseen by us. But while we may not see him, we must always believe that he is working. The psalmist writes, Psalm 62 verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Sometimes God is unseen. And certainly there will be times when we have to acknowledge that we do not know what God is doing. And yet, even then, we ought to have confidence that everything that God is doing is good. And yes, there will be times when we find ourselves torn with many doubts. But we must rest assured that at the right time and the perfect moment, God will intervene to save his people. Spoiler alert, the story of Esther ends with the people of God being spared from this terrible threat of destruction that hung over them. The unseen God shielded them from danger. But please understand that sometimes this unseen God allows his people to suffer. He allows his people to be crushed. Does this mean that God doesn't care? Does this mean that he's withdrawn his love? He's, he's turned his back on the people of his choice? Not at all. And we know this. We know this with certainty. Because Jesus went to the cross. There he suffered and died for our sins. There he was crying out to his father to spare him this pain. Yet he ultimately humbled himself to his father's good and perfect will. And as a consequence, Paul writes in Philippians 2 and 9, Therefore God exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. You know, the parable that Jesus teaches in, in Luke 16 of, of Lazarus and the rich man and how Lazarus lay at this rich man's gate and, and suffered a miserable life. But in a dramatic reversal of fortune, after death, he found himself in the care of Abraham's bosom and the delight of a heavenly home while the rich man languished afar off in hell. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 12, those words with which you began our service. For those who exalt themselves will be humble and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We don't know when that, that will be. But we do know that it will be. And God's people know that however blessed their lives are, however many times it seems that God has intervened for our cause, it will not be until we see God face to face that we will 
receive and understand the true blessing that Jesus died to gain for us. Then we will be able to say with Paul in Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So have you humbled yourself before the one who in humility gave himself up to death on the cross for you? If you haven't already done so, if you haven't already placed your life and your future eternal life into the hands, the Neil pierced hands of Jesus, please think seriously about this. Do get in touch so that I, I can help you in any way possible that you might know and have this wonderful assurance of a glorious eternity. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are in control, that you are at work, that you are doing good, that you are saving those who call upon you. Lord, yes, we are in dark and difficult days. Yes, at times it seems that your help has not come when we've called to you. At times, Lord, our hearts are wrenched and broken. We feel that, that the whole world has turned against us. But Lord, may we know with confidence that even the, the, the sorrows and the struggles of, of this present time will be forgotten by us in the glory of what's yet to be. That if we humble ourselves, if we look to you, you in due season will lift us up. You will draw us to yourself. You will allow your glory to radiate all around us. Lord, that is what we anticipate as we hope even now in Christ. Yes, the way might be difficult, it may be dark, but Christ will lead us on and he, as he has promised, will bring us safely home. So comfort us and care for us, encourage us with such thoughts as we pray in his name. Amen. This week we're going to catch up with the work of Peter and Valerie Lockwood as they serve God in Nepal. Hello, I'm Peter Lockwood. And I'm Valerie. We live in Kathmandu, Nepal, with our three children, Connor, Joel and Erin. We've been serving as PCI Global Mission Workers in Nepal since 2012, and in that time we have been seconded to the United Mission to Nepal. United Mission to Nepal, or UMN, is a Christian development organisation which carries out community development work, particularly in the rural areas, but also continues to run and operate two mission hospitals in Tansan and in Okudunga. I'm a program advisor with the United Mission to Nepal and also a member of the leadership team. And we seek to provide strategic direction, but also help in the planning and implementation of the various programs. And I am a part of the member care team at UMN, where we offer a wide variety of support to the expatriates that come to work here. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an adverse effect on Nepal, as like many other areas in the world. It's adversely impacted the hospital's uh, patient revenue and patient numbers has declined rapidly. But there's also been great uncertainty as to the role it plays in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The hospitals provide general medical care, but also we've been able to construct new isolation facilities to deal with COVID-19 patients. Our community development work has also been adversely affected. Our cluster offices have had to close, but we have been able to maintain some work through our local partners, particularly providing relief distribution, but also PPE equipment uh, to government quarantine facilities and also health facilities. And we as a family have been in lockdown in our home here in Kathmandu. We've been working from home and the kids have been doing online schooling. We as a family are extremely thankful for your support through the United Appeal. The resources from the United Appeal are an essential and vital component that enable us to continue to serve here in Nepal. We are also mindful and grateful for your continued and indispensable prayer support. As you as a congregation seek to go deeper and wider in global mission, we would love that you would pray for these three issues. First, if you would remember the United Mission to Nepal hospitals in Okadunga and Hansen, 
that they would have wisdom and discernment as they navigate the financial crunch, but also as they seek to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and also provide continued excellent general medical care in the rural areas of Nepal. Secondly, we would ask you to pray for us as a family as we continue to navigate the daily challenges of working from home and doing online schooling. And thirdly, for your men's community development work, uh, that it would be able to continue, but also that we would have wisdom as to when we can reopen our cluster offices and re-engage in community development work. Finally, we would like to assure you of our prayers uh, for you in your congregation of PCI. We pray for your ministry where God has placed you to be a witness to his eternal kingdom of righteousness and justice. Let's bring our prayers to God for others. Let us pray. Father, we remember before you the work of Peter and Valerie Lockwood as they serve with UMN in Nepal. We pray for them as they seek to encourage and come alongside the Christian people in that nation to help them in uh, their faith and in their discipleship. And as they want to serve the people and work among them for the good of all. We pray for the two hospitals for Tanzan and Okladunga. We pray, Father, that they would be able to continue to work in spite of the strict financial constraints upon them. That they might be able to provide all the care necessary, both for the problems of COVID and for general well-being of the people and the communities in which they are set. Bless and provide all the resources necessary for that ongoing medical intervention. Bless the Lockwood family, Lord. Be with them as they raise their children and as they deal with the challenges of homeschool and working from home. May they still continue to be effective. May the children learn well and enjoy even these challenging days as they live in the restrictions of Kathmandu. And Father, we pray for those little clusters out all across the community where people come together for support and for supplies. And we ask again that all the challenges of the logistics of that mountainous terrain and the difficulties of uh, restrictions caused, caused by COVID would uh, soon be set aside so that the work would resume and blessing and benefit in your name would be brought to the people of Nepal. Father, we do pray for that nation. We pray for the troubled nations of our world. We remember again the ongoing conflict in, in Syria, that civil war that has raged now for decades. Watch over the people, particularly those who love you, Lord. Make them bold for Christ in trying times. Bless the nation of Myanmar, Lord, and we ask again that soon peace and stability would be established there and a, a good and democratic government would be put in place. Protect the people, particularly again, Lord, those uh, faithful followers of Christ. May they shine brightly in the uh, blackened backdrop of, of troubled times. And Father, we pray for the nation of Brazil and in particular the state of Acre as they wrestle with the twin trials of both COVID and the outbreak of dengue fever. Lord, we pray for uh, normality to be resumed soon there, for supplies and help to get through to people and that the loss of life would be kept in check. Lord, we think of the city of Manaus in Amazonas, Lord, where so many people have died of COVID. Again, bless and protect the church there and make it a, a, a real blessing to the people in the face of such a trial. Father, we ask again for our own families, our friends, our own locality, you know, our ongoing challenges as this lockdown extends. May we keep together united as a fellowship of God's people. May we stay effective in serving you, Lord, in spite of the restrictions placed upon us. May the work on our meeting house continue unabated and soon be available to us finished and, uh, and a real blessing for the ministry of our congregation into the community of Portadown. Lord, bless our families, bless our children uh, being taught at home. And as, as school starts to resume, may that uh, be done with wisdom and may it be a benefit to all and guide teachers as they juggle all the responsibilities. Protect jobs in our community, Lord. Look after the economy and we know uh, the difficulties that this lockdown has brought. May people sense that you're with them, helping them in ways they couldn't have imagined. And Father, we pray for those who struggle with their health. 
those facing surgery, those undergoing treatment, those feeling weighed down by just a sense of unwellness, whether physically or mentally or spiritually. May they know you're coming to them, lifting them up and restoring them, blessing them beyond measure. Father, hear our prayers for our people. Work in our nation, work in our world. Extend your kingdom, win heart after heart, soul after soul to yourself. As we ask and pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and for his sake alone. Amen. We're going to sing together, King of Kings, Majesty. for taking time to join with us. If you can, please do leave a little comment uh, so that we know who has been gathering together uh, in worship around God's work. And now may God go before you to lead you, go behind you to protect you, go beneath you to support you. May God go beside you to befriend you. And may this blessing of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.